Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, ah, very good. You're all recorded <laughs> with your good evening. Here we are in the fourth and last scheduled session um, of uh, a letter to the a letter to the American Church. Glad that you're all here, and it's been a, just rewarding for me to spend this time with you. So thank you so much for all of your contributions <laughs> to what we do, and uh, we're going to have a good time tonight. I'm pretty confident, based on the way things went on Sunday. Come on, there we go. Um, here's all the stuff most of you have seen. Um, I added six people to our emailing list today. Some of those had come in. Some of those requests had come in a little bit ago, and I've been backlogged with Holy Week stuff. So my apologies for being slow. Um, the recordings of the previous three are available at the church website. Just at the top, it says um, adults. Click on that, and then classes, and you, you'll find this class and a number of links, both for this class and a lot of previous classes, including one of Pastor Carol Clark's that was recorded back during uh, the early part of COVID. Um, understand that microphone's live. So some of you have occasionally been whispering, thinking it didn't hear you. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Thankfully, you were all very nice. Um, and then you, we have people who uh, was on Zoom with us as well. They're live right now. So they have their microphones muted, but they're encouraged to speak up whenever they like, and we'll be able to hear you here in the room quite well. Um, and you've heard this before. So if you have a question or comment, please do speak. Um, and that's what this is all about. We need to hear one another. Okay? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, we come together in a world that swirls all about us with things that we scarcely understand and, and we don't know how to approach. And yet, Lord God, you have placed us here in this time. You have placed us here with abilities that you have given us from the time we were born. Show us, Lord God, how to use those abilities in, in this world that exists so that the Christian message is heard and uh, that love and, uh, and tolerance go hand in hand and that we do so with a, a heart that brings about a better world and that uh, we go out and we serve our neighbors in ways that make our, our neighbors um, in, in better shape, uh, raised up to so that they too can use their voices in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. And you've seen these things in the previous three classes too. It's not a Bible study that we're doing here, but we are free to apply the Bible, and please do, where that makes sense. Um, we'll recognize the Holy Spirit alive in each of us. I keep pointing to Bonhoeffer because that's uh, much of the, the talk here. Bonhoeffer was one in an extreme minority in, in his world. Um, and now we're listening to him very carefully. So if we have a minority voice among us, we should listen very carefully. We don't know how the Spirit is working. Uh, so be respectful from, of one another uh, when we don't agree. And, and there will be places we don't agree. That's just human nature. Um, and we can agree or disagree with Mr. Metaxas, the, the things he's drawn and the interpretations of scripture he has. You're free to do that. Uh, this, again, the Spirit is alive in you as it is in him, and we may disagree with one another. But again, we'll do that in the love of Christ. Okay. Um, please, when it's your turn to speak, and everybody gets a turn, and many turns if necessary, but please be as brief as you can, just to allow some space uh, for others to speak before it's time to go home, before I throw you all out of here. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Oh. Bless you. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, if it's not necessary that you, you read the Metaxas text, um, but if you did, you can probably guess what the opening scripture is, right? It's Jesus' parable of the talents. And so just to refresh your memory or to introduce you to it, as the case may be, Jesus said, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Anybody know how much a talent is in the ancient world? How much money it is? For your average ordinary worker, 
it's 10 years wages. One down. Yeah, so it's not a paltry sum. It's not a little sack like you saw in the in the Feldboard lessons when you were a kid. So one gets 10 years wages, 120, 150, and then some of them are going to double that. So it's a considerable lavish amount they're being handed. So that may color your, your interpretation. And then this next brief sentence, then he, the master, in Greek is the word kurios, that can be translated master or lord, he went away. What that signals and what other signals you'll get later is this is a signal about the Christ going away for an indeterminate amount of time and then coming back in a time of judgment. Okay, so he, the Lord, the Curios, the Master, goes away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. Now you would think, you know, our, our minds are, are key to hear the word talent and think abilities, and you can use that metaphor if you like. But isn't it interesting that these two people with different abilities both double the money? Maybe it's not about their ability at all. Maybe it's more about what the Lord intended when he gave them this exorbitant amount. In any event, in the same way, the one who, uh, verse 18, excuse me, but the one who had received one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Sounds sort of weird, doesn't it? We, we make jokes about people who bury money in the ground. In the year 70, when the Romans came and sacked Jerusalem and, and destroyed the temple, leaving it in the condition it is today, the Romans found buried gold and silver all over Jerusalem. It was a common practice in Jesus' time. So Jesus knew of which he spoke in this, in that little bit of the parable. <laughs> After a long time, we have a, the master or lord of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Time for judgment. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you've handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and, it's the same word as faithful, trustworthy slave. Well done, good and faithful servant. Ever heard that before? The funerals, right? Often. Well, this is at the time of the judgment. That's why we use it at funerals. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Which is the key phrase. Entering into the master's eternal joy. And the one with the two talents came forward, forward also saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Bless you. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. Remember good and, and trustworthy? It's in parallel to wicked and lazy. Trustworthy or faithful in par comparison to lazy. So what this parable is about in terms of what the other two slaves did was about faith in action, or in this case, there's inaction, <clears throat> laziness, right? You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten. <laughs> For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. Again, we're talking about faith in action. Those who have faith in action will have more such. But from those who have no faith in action, even what they have in this life will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping 
and get gnashing of teeth. I love that G. <laughs> that's just pretty harsh stuff. That's pretty harsh stuff. But what Jesus is looking for is faith in action. And saying one has faith and burying it in the ground is not, not favorable to the Lord. And this, this is hard to deal with. <clears throat> And when you compare it to what we studied in Revelation not too long ago, it, it has some of the same ring to it here and there. It's not all grace-filled. It's judgment-filled, too. But remember, the grace is up front. The Master gave them all that they needed, all that they could possibly need. All he, all he expected was that they would put it to work. And the work did itself. It did itself its own favor by bringing about um, the doubling, if you will. Okay. All right. Last time we asked, who do you say God is? Right? Who is God in your in your estimation, in, in your life? Is, is God a hard master? Is God one who has you shaking in the knees that if you do something untoward or something unfavorable in God's eyes that you're going to get whacked or smote, as the Bible used to say, right? Is, is that who, who God is in your mindset, yeah. even sometimes, right? Or is God one who loves you and extends grace and gives you talents, gives you talents and, and cheers you on as, as you put those talents to work? Which God do you worship? And, and we see that the comparison of different ways these slaves approached their notion of God in the parable, right? So the parable teaches a number of things, and the taxes would illustrate these things. Those who risked those, that amount of money, those things entrusted to them by the Lord, are rewarded. The ones who play it safe, not so much. Right? Play it safe by burying it in the ground so we don't lose a nickel of it, of 10 years' wages. And Jesus doesn't give us an example of a middle path. Now, there's a lot more to this parable than Metaxas examines. There was a gentleman who came into uh, one of the Sunday classes, brought a commentary with him, and, and showed seven, seven different ways to slice this parable seven different emphases and jesus tells stories that are like that they're tremendously deep as well as broad and and metaxas point was number three on that list of seven so there's a lot more to this than, than is being presented tonight and uh it won't be too long and when i'm back on my feet we'll have uh, a course on parables and this will be one we'll dig much more deeply in than we have tonight but you get the sense of this. But Jesus, at least in you know, topic number three, he doesn't offer a middle path. You're either working as one of, of God's servants or you're not. Some people have different abilities and can work more successfully or, or longer hours or whatnot than others, but work nonetheless, given the abilities that God has gifted you. So why does Jesus give us this lesson? had to be shocking to the people of his time standing around him. That wasn't the way the temple cult ran. So, but we're not in the temple cult now. Why does Jesus give us this lesson in our time, in our place? What do you think? We're not to use him as fire insurance. <laughs> fire insurance? I like that. I haven't heard that analogy before. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Well, it's the people who say... I believe I'm a Christian, but they've got their fire in, they think they've got their fire insurance and then they go back to living life the way they always do. Yeah. It's basically, oops, don't want to go to hell, so I'll get my fire insurance, but that's where it ends. It's all talk, no action. Right. Yeah, I'm a Christian with my mouth, but not with my limbs. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Would that mean the chief grace that 
earlier, Bonhoeffer utilized the, uh, the word cheat phrase. You well, believe so you're saved, so you don't have to do anything. And Bonhoeffer coined that. I don't know if he was the originator, but he, he made it famous by offering that saying. Speaking of people, excuse me, in the 1930s, early 30s, who uh, would profess their faith by way of creeds and other such uh, ways of behaving in worship, but they didn't live Christian lives and, and didn't get involved, quite frankly, in the world as Christians. Bonhoeffer saw that as, as horribly wrongheaded and, uh, and railed against it in his Reformation Day sermon in 1932, as Hitler was just days away from taking power. And they, they were perfectly sanguine to let him do it. Maybe the analogy is not perfect to our time, but it's alarming. Are we the ones who just simply act as Christians for an hour or so a week and uh, don't really behave as Christians or speak as Christians when we go out in the world or when we encounter evil? We don't say anything about that, as was the case for Bonhoeffer and, and people of his time. Do we even recognize evil when we see it? How would we know? You know, Satan. Satan's a pretty crafty person, personage. When he meets Jesus and takes him out into the wilderness to tempt him, Satan knows scripture very, very well, better than most pastors, I would dare say. How do you know Satan when you hear him and see him? He looks like, sounds like, one of us. <clears throat> How do you know? Do you have any new realizations from what Metaxas talked about as he analyzed this parable in his fashion? Agree or not? Or is this one, this parable pretty well known to you? It's pretty well known. But it reinforces the notion that you have all this, all these abilities, resources, what have you, you ought to go out and use them. Did it make any difference to you when you found out how much a talent was in terms of dollar value or, or labor value? Yeah, and we don't often spend a lot of time talking about money yeah. in the church. Um, but a, a 10 years wages for a single talent. Um, be nice to have 10 years wages <laughs> handed to me in a wheelbarrow or however that's going to be delivered. Yeah. Um, that was, you know, that was something I dug yeah. into this week because I didn't know how much a talent was either. I had seen it once before, but I forgot. Right. We, we hear about denarii a lot more as a day's wages, but a talent is, is a tremendous amount more than that. So a normal person in Jesus' time would never see a talent all in one spot, right? But isn't that the way it is with eternity? We don't really see it. We're, we try to reason it with our brains, but we don't see it. And the more we read the word, then we can see it and we can kind of put ourselves in it. But if we don't have time to read the word, how do we see it? That's true. That's true. I turn it the other way. I mean, both can be true. How do you start out in life? You start out in life by the master, the Lord, giving you a tremendous amount, talent, life. You're placed in this life at a certain time that the Lord has ordained, right? And you're given everything you need to be fully successful in the Lord's eyes. It's a lot. A lot, especially in America. Right. That's that's a talent load, right? So we're we're given this great gift of grace, and, and the Lord isn't there cracking the whip saying do do do. He's, mm -hmm. he's seemingly distant, he's gone away. And then how do we behave with that load of talent until he comes back? Well, I think the church, we've kind of become very performative rather than 
doers of the word. So we're to live our life out with whatever we're inclined to do, but we should be doing, not just coming to a service or, you know, we need to find out where help is needed and get there and do it. Jesus taught us a lot along those lines. You know, one is to love your neighbor, love your enemy as well. I mean, what does that mean? It's not a romantic love that Jesus is talking about there. It's, it's to care about the well-being of the other. How do you do that by reading about it in the newspaper? I mean, I'm not disparaging newspapers. What I'm saying is that the way you do that is having contact with the other to care enough to ask them, how are you doing? How can I help you? And, and have that, that sort of relationship with somebody that Jesus would call loving. And uh, quite frankly, it, it's my experience in the modern world, we don't do a lot of that. It, it struck me, you know, I, I lived in Albuquerque back in the 90s, and then I went to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and um, went to two places in Michigan. And then it hit me when I got to Alaska, how I'd been living. And I didn't even realize it. In, in those previous places, places previous to Alaska, I didn't know most of my neighbors' names. People got home from work and went in the house, right? And uh, had burglar bars and all that kind of stuff. I was living in, on an island in Alaska that had been, the, the town center had been destroyed by a tsunami back in the 60s. And the island had later in the late 80s been buried under a cloud of ash from a volcanic eruption on the mainland of Alaska. So they'd gone through those two things and they'd learned that when those kinds of things happen, there's no help from the outside world possible. The airport runway was only four feet above sea level and stood right on the, on the beach at one end of the runway. So no planes were getting in if you had a tsunami, especially. And then when you have a tsunami, it takes out the, uh, the port and it takes a long time to rebuild the port. So there's, there's no help coming. Neighbors have to help each other. And so the way of life on Kodiak Island was drastically different than what I uh, lived in three different states before going there. I mean, I, I was, we were unloading the, the shipping container with our household goods, and we had people coming from everywhere wanting to introduce themselves and say, hey, look, I've got a store of food over here, and I've got a store of this and that over there. If you need it, come see me. Our church was on high ground. It was deemed safe from tsunamis. So the basement, it's really a crawl space. So the crawl space underneath the, the church's sanctuary was filled with military MREs. And our church was a, an evacuation site. So <clears throat> when this horn sounded at three in the morning, and for some reason, God sends tsunamis only at three in the morning, <laughs> everybody ran up to the church and other places like it and, and sat in the sanctuary. And we put the TV on the screens so that they could get weather and news updates. And we had food and water to sustain them for a period of days. You don't see that generally in, in the rest of the country. Well, you see a lot of helping when there's other natural disasters. You don't see it here because nothing ever happens here. Yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, so we are on practice. So, yeah. yeah. Be careful what comes out. I thought of that. Yeah. You put the whammy on all of us. <laughs> Nancy, no, I'm going to stay up all night. <laughs> uh -oh. One of the points Metaxas made in his writing was that uh, we have the freedom to choose what God is like. Right? When you think about the the two who were successful with their talents and the one who buried it in the ground, they had very different <laughs> ideas of what God was. They, they made God to be according to their preconceived notions. My words, not, not anybody else's. Um, if we choose to know and then get to know and love and interact with the God who is grace-filled and loving, then grace-filled, loving God is ours, Right? That's, that's your relationship with God. If you decide that God is that hard master, if, if that's 
you know, your preconceived notion or your mistaken notion, however you come to that, when you when you get to that, that's what God seems to be. God's tough when you insist God's tough. Then why would we want to worship God? That's how we felt. Heck of a question, isn't it? Yeah. In Jesus' parable. Well, in Jesus' parable, there's not much worship going on with that one, with the ten, with the single talent at the beginning. Yeah, fear. Fear. It's hard to worship what, what you fear, right? And then we get confused with that Bible word where it says fear the Lord. And it's it's you know, have respect for the Lord is I think a better translation for that. But um, if, if you have fear and trembling about the Lord, it's hard to have a loving relationship. Some of us have had wonderful, loving parents as we grew up in our childhood. Some of us had rough and or abusive parents as we grew up, right? And sometimes that becomes part of our psyche. It becomes part of our being. And then we imagine God to be like an abusive father if we had one. And, and others come to that understanding without having an abusive father. Well, Nonetheless, some have, no father. some have no father at all, right? Or mother, for that matter. It, it goes right. both ways. But however you come to that, that thought, God becomes a frightful personage if you're fearful of God, if that's the way you approach the relationship. That was Metaxas' point. You guys can help me out. There's a proverb, a psalm that says something to effect. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah, and that's... It's like that. Well, but it's not the fear and trembling fear. That's the respect fear. Okay. I've had, you know, that's good old King James <laughs> does that for us. So, so, Metaxas made this point. This is the most provocative of all. If, however you got there, if you have this understanding that that hard master is who God is, and you can't bring yourself to worship that hard master, have you really turned God into a satanic personage in your own understanding and in your own relationship? What do you think of that idea? Seems reasonable. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, if you're not worshiping the you know, you know, that's the same thing as worshiping Satan. But in our political life, if we don't vote, that means we are voting for something. It was like the 12,000 pastors who yeah. had nothing to say as Hitler rose. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yes, Russ. So, so I get, I'm sort of struggling with that. I mean, I mean um, you know, if, the, if you look at the Bible, there are times when God um, was hard on his people. Um, when he did it out of love, mm -hmm. he was hard. Sure. Um, it, 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 so in my life, I can, I struggle with both of those. At times I'm going, okay, you know, why me? Why now? Why this? Um, Overall, I think he's grace sharing and he's loving, but um, it, to me, it's not black and white. And I really struggle that at times if you if you have a if you're feeling that God is being a hard minister to Satan, I just don't get that at all. Um, That's fair. I mean, it's the same thing as a parent. You know, at times you love your children to death, but sometimes tough love is love. It's just not what they really maybe think they need at the time. And it's the same as us, in my opinion. So I don't, I personally don't buy that that you're open to fear. Choosing Satan. Yeah, we, we could probably spend hours talking about is the personage of Satan Satan real or is it the collection of sin, one one theory, or is it our misguided worship of the hard master? You know, there's all these different theories that uh, are unresolved, and we could spend a lot of time on that. But let me try. Let me try this to address what Russ said in part. 
And it's my favorite original parable. <laughs> so some of you have heard it. When, when a toddler is in your family, right? A toddler comes into the kitchen at mealtime. You begin to teach the toddler how the family approaches mealtime, right? You give them a fork and a spoon, not a knife. In the fork and a spoon, you show, show them along with a napkin how those things go alongside the plate at the table. And this is how we set the table, right? And when the child gets that right, you throw a big fuss and you give them a cookie and you, you reinforce this good behavior, right? Next night, same toddler comes into the kitchen, sees this pretty blue flower that they want to pick and give to mommy. And they go to pick it, but it's the gas flame on the stove. You clap their hand and you say no. Slapping in hand and saying no is every bit as loving an act as reinforcing the setting of the table the night before. So in the example that, that Russ gave us, it's very accurate. Sometimes God had to say no. He didn't unlove the people. And they probably smarted from being told no in the way they were sent into exile or whatever the example is that you wish to pick. But God didn't unlove them. So can, can you recognize when your parent says that these are the bounds? This is beyond good behavior, even though you really want to do that which they said no to, that your parent still loves you? Sure, until the parent becomes abusive, right? There is a line to be crossed. Metaxas kind of expounds on this at the bottom of 113. He says, have you chosen, he says, you chose the God whom you chose, and that God is your God. Have you chosen the true God or a counterfeit? If you have chosen the counterfeit, behold, you have chosen Satan. Right. So I interpret that if you don't see God as loving, but who will uh, discipline for better responses, just like a parent does. If you're seeing him, I would guess maybe in your analogy, as being uh, abusive, so cross the line, then truly you would have to admit that you have chosen wrongly about God. At least that's my take. I'm sure he was driving. Now we can again be free to disagree with him, and that is that part of it is is a tough take to be sure. Yeah. Okay. I saw. I, I interpreted the uh, the original Bible, uh, the Old Testament, as a God that is a little bit more uh, harsh, or or slapping your hand when you're going to the flame. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the New Testament. And Jesus is there, the Son of God. He preaches nothing but love, or at least that's what it seems like. He does. Now, that could be that maybe God is softened <laughs> or changed, or maybe in the Old Testament, we weren't getting it, or they weren't getting it, and he had to be a little stricter. But within Jesus' time, when he's there with us, it seems like he was just preaching, preaching love. He was when he preached, but he was also witnessing in the streets. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in the streets, he was pretty harsh. Go and sin no more. Mm -hmm. right? Don't do that again. Right. Sort of thing. He, he didn't cast anybody into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. But he tells the story that it's cautionary. Be careful or that's where you could be. Right? He goes into the temple and he up, upsets the entire temple called at Passover time by, by turning those tables over and getting rid of the money changing operation that was going on. It's a harsh operation. And I have to be careful. Get behind me, Satan is not a passing little phrase. It is harsh. It is real harsh. You know, I wonder, another passage you read us from the New Testament, you know, this throwing out the money changers. You know, you think of that one fellow who buried his, 
is one talent. <clears throat> yeah, I look at that and I think, okay, he was a little scared to be thrown into outer darkness. Wow. That's something else. And then the money changers, yeah, they're making money in the temple. So my point is, if Christ is harsh on these type of transgressions, I wonder what he thinks about what's going on in our country today. Well, and that's where Metaxas drives. And that's yeah. the question that we have to constantly wrestle with, right? I mean, all through history, but this is our time. So we wrestle with it now. We have the example of the 1930s, but it, nothing is perfectly the same, can't be. But we have to wrestle with that now. And I'm not saying I, I know precisely what evil is and is not in our society, but we collectively have to wrestle with that. We have to wrestle with that in our homes, in our communities, in our state, in our nation. I think it, it's one of those things we have to constantly put our talents to work at. Sorry about mixing that up, but I think we have to constantly be doing that. If not, it's to our peril. It's when we get that dumb and happy and sit in the barco lounger that problems crop up. Our faith is not in action at that point. And he gives us choices to make. He told the woman, go and sin no more. Now, she had a choice to make. Yes, ma'am. And, and uh, God gives us the free will to make those choices. Choices, well. you know? <laughs> And that in itself, I believe, is an act of love. Yes. Because a harsh master would say, you're going to do thus and so on Thursday, you know? But he didn't. No. And then these, these two who did well with their talents are told, enter into the joy of your master. The reward is not more talents. They get more talents. They're entrusted with more talents. But at this time of judgment, as Jesus stands there, this is the reward. Entering into the life with a joyful Lord. Quite a contrast to the harsh Lord that the other imagined. So, we're already dancing around this. God has given you great gifts, each one different from the other. God has given you birth and life in this time, in this you know, era with these circumstances that we live in. Um, how do you risk them? Or do you bury them in the ground? I mean, risk is the opposite of burying them in the ground, if you'll take that, that metaphor. What do you think? How do you how do you put that to work, that faith in action? Could we use instead of a talent, could we use a decade and say God has given us some people get you know, five decades, some people get a no. decade, no. some people get ten decades. And I would say an analogy that I foresee is people who choose to um, go down paths that lead to destruction like alcohol, drugs, um, gambling, and have that they are burying their talents. They're burying those days of working to glorify God and use the talents God has given. That talents could be opportunities. So maybe what we can say is um, nothing is assured. So a person who has those, say, five decades has a longer life and has the, the joy of the master is hopefully heaven. You've done good. Sure. You're a good and faithful servant. You're a sheep. You're not a goat. You're <laughs> at the end when the sheep and the goats are divided, but it may have something to do with years. Um, obviously, somebody who is an alcoholic and drugs, they may take their life. And that's like burying your talent for sure. So just a little bit of a different take. I mean, and then the other thing I want to go back to is Satan. Satan being the collection of the evil thoughts and the evil actions of a society 
doesn't really address that if we believe in angels and the Old Testament and the New Testament is full of documentation that angels exist, can we also not believe that Satan and his demons are entities mm -hmm. and they fell from grace? Um, you know, a person who has died, say a child who has died, people will say, well, now you have a little angel in heaven to look after you. It's a platitude. It's something that makes them feel better and hopefully the parents feel better. It's not true. Angels are separate than human beings mm -hmm. and demons are fallen angels and they exist. And they're there to lead people, to get in people's hearts, to do some really horrible things. That's what's happening now. And you have to call it what it is. It's an entity. And what do we do about that? Okay. And what does Metaxas say about that? I, about angels and demons? Yeah. Nothing that I read right. in that book anyway. And people will say that evil man. You know, Churchill never said his name. In all his speeches, he referred to Hitler as that evil man. And so to me, he was... Saying it like it was, he is evil. So we have evil people like that today. I heard another story about Churchill just yesterday. Yeah. Um, you know, at one point, um, Hitler approached Churchill and asked him to be an ally and be part of uh, the Axis, as we now call them. And Churchill was undecided about what to do, whether to accept that offer or not. Obviously, that's earlier on in the war. So Churchill did a rather interesting thing. He went out. He went out on trains. He went out on walks around London places, and he talked to people. What do you think we should do with this offer? And, and the offer was almost unanimous, that it should be rejected and, and Hitler should be pushed away. And it was on that basis that he took his stand against Hitler. So if we see something we believe to be, uh, just by analogy, if we see something to be evil in our world today as it lives, how, how do we know it's evil? Well, maybe we take the Churchillian approach. We talk to people like this and find out if our perception uh, rings true and, and get advice from others. And then the congregation helps inform the individual. Okay. Well, a lot of the answers are right there in scripture. I mean, God made male and female. He didn't, There, it wasn't multiple choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, some of them are, some things are very simple to know that, you know, is that following God or isn't it? And I mean, some of them are really simple. The Bible gives us a number, a great number of base facts, as you point to one. What the Bible doesn't tell us specifically is how do you go out and deal with people in the world who disagree with the Bible? They've come to some other conclusion. Jesus gives us examples of dealing with them in truth and love. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know the truth of the Bible. How do you deal with the person out there? or the group out there, or the demonstrators at the church door, or whatever the future may bring. How, that's a different question, and the Bible doesn't give you black and white answers to that. <clears throat> and that's that's what I believe the wisdom of the congregation is needed for. I mean, we, we think back to COVID, and there were restrictions put on churches during that time. And I wasn't here yet. I was in another church with a different church council, but this church council, just like mine, was dealing with all kinds of things. Do we comply with this, or do we skirt around that, or do we, you know, how do we deal with this? And they needed the wisdom of each other to support those decisions. And it, and the COVID was uncharted territory. Absolutely. Totally. I mean, we, we heard about it for decades, you know, what happens if a pandemic hits, but you know, mm -hmm. we, lived through, we lived through it. I mean, we don't wash your hands. <laughs>
Okay. Let's let's look at some topics from chapter 14 if we can. Um, Metaxas makes this claim. If we come to believe that we're in charge of life, if you will, and God's not in charge of these things, but rather it's it's the hubris of humanity that says, I'm I'm the, the wisdom here. Don't haven't we made ourselves to be a God? Isn't that the ultimate idolatry? Right? What do you think about that? Well, we're saying we're better than God and we know more than he does. So yes, we've made when did that start. When did that start in humanities? Well, in the Bible's record. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. And the serpent said, you eat this, you'll be a God, right? And it, it kept going because we didn't want to hear God. He was making all that noise on the mountain with those 613 commandments, not 10, 613. Didn't want to hear all that. Moses, you go listen to it. We don't want to hear it. We'll stay down here. And then when God started traveling with them, they built a box to put him in called the Ark of the Covenant, right? Keep God in the box. It's a lot safer for us. We can do our thing out here. Humans have been doing this all along. And Jesus absolutely rejected that idea. And it, most graphically, as he dies on the cross, you might hear something about this on Friday. As he dies on the cross, the temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. It's as if this cosmic hand split that thing as tall as it was or as long as it was, top to bottom. What's behind the curtain? The box. Jesus and his spirit are out of the box, loose in the world. Don't put God in the box, right? And we put him in the box so that we can bank on our wisdom, in that case, in the temple cult, rather than let God be God. Lots of examples of that in the Bible, especially in the Elder Testament. Mark, since God gave us free will on your first question, uh, how does that apply to that question? Well, we come to believe we're in charge. I mean, he's given us free, free will, so we are in charge of the, the decisions we make. That doesn't mean we think we're God. Sometimes, right? Well, let's go back to 1 Samuel. Let's, we'll, we'll stick to the Bible for this for the moment. Um, up until the record of 1 Samuel, the people of God, all through Moses' time and beyond, were never ruled by a king. They never were in charge. God was the king. There were judges who resolved disputes, but God was the king. And then the people got jealous of those other people over there that had kings. They wanted a king too. They'll do better in battle that way, they thought. So they screamed and yelled, God, we want a king. God said, you want a king? All right. And they picked Saul. How'd that work for him? <laughs> you know, and, and as we went through the history of Israel, the, there were only a few successful kings. There were dozens of, of horrid ones. And the nation descended with them as they were in charge with their personally chosen and anointed representatives called kings. It was a disaster. In the founding of this nation, as I read the founding documents, the idea was that rights, those things that, that we should do and, and avoid, doing, those things flow from God. Those are the unalienable rights. Right? They flow from God, not from any humans, not from kings, not from presidents, not from congresses, but from God. And uh, you know, if, the one thing that keeps me awake at night, and I sleep real well, but the, the one thing that can cause me to lose some sleep is the wonder, are, are we losing that as a society, that, that God reigns in, in what is right and what is wrong, what we're uh, commissioned to do by God? Are, 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 is the humans, are the humans taking over and pushing God completely out of the direction 
of this nation or this community or pick any division of uh, collections of people you want. So you've been trying to. Well, it's it's been a 200 year process. Yeah. So just like Israel was on a long death slope for much of its history, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of that way for, for the U.S. We're, we're not getting better in that regard. My opinion. That topic was dealt with about a week ago. Um, a news woman stated that there are actually people in this country that believe uh, that their rights come from God. And those people are now called Christian nationalists. Mm -hmm. And that, no, you get your rights from the government. Um, yeah, that was actually stated a week ago. It's been a matter of controversy the last two or three days oh. related to another matter. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've been hearing that language for six months or a year or so. That's how the left does it. They're going to make a boogeyman out of those of mm -hmm. us who have a high regard for scripture and God. And we're going to call them Christian nationalists. Oh my God. They're going to take over the country. <laughs> <laughs> Women will be kept in their kitchens, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> That's the most ludicrous <laughs> thing around if you believe it. But don't believe it. Well, Jesus told his followers that they would not be held in high regard in society. And he told us the spirit would be with us when we came to the time of trial. We have to trust in that. And these things aren't new. The names have changed, but the, the process has been the same for at least 2,000 years since Jesus born this battle. So I don't know that we overreact to it, but how do we interact with a, with a situation that, that some of us, not all, perceive this as quite adversarial. How do we deal with that? And again, we draw on the wisdom of one another, and especially the wisdom of God's word, and uh, that which we gain through prayer. Metaxas also said, being a Christian is not about avoiding sin, but about passion, passionately and courageously serving God. Emphasis on the serving. What do you think about that? We're human. We're going to sin. It's yep. always that. We're, we're not sin free until we're in eternity or we're dead or both. <laughs> One leads to the other. Yes. <laughs> so that's the reality when people say, oh, the church is full of nothing but hypocrites. It's like, well, yeah, but at least we're forgiven hypocrites. <laughs> and we keep trying to, to be better about not being hypocrites. Well, why have why have we done our best to maintain confession and forgiveness as a right at the beginning of worship? A lot of churches have dropped that. <laughs> and it's in recognition of just that. Yes, okay. Well, um, I don't know how long we're gonna go. So this is the burning um uh, thought in our house. My husband was uh historian and he loves politics and he wanted to know and I didn't find it in the book but he thinks that the government passing the IRS 503c which makes churches tax exempt is, C3, yeah. thank you that has is a ploy of the federal system to quiet pastors from speaking in the pulpit and i just wanted to know if i missed it in the book it wasn't in the book okay and i just wanted to know is i mean if, if if you and people at faith came out against let's say the transgender issue from the pulpit and would you lose the tax exempt status no. for our church no um, if the, the Johnson bill that was passed in 1967, um, when he was still in the Senate, um, 57, 50, 57, 50, excuse 57. me, 57 said that if we enter into political campaigns, that is adv um, advocating for this candidate or that, or for, um, voting for this bill or that, if, for those on the public ballot, those things would put a church or any nonprofit subject to losing their nonprofit status. 
but coming out to speak about social issues is not one of those concerns. So, so you know, sure my... just that our excuse me, Carl, um, just had, uh, in that thinking. So a church that would come out saying we are against abortion, mm -hmm. they would not lose their tax exempt status. Correct. Well, the Roman Catholic Church historically has always said that and never lost their tax exempt status. That doesn't mean they wouldn't try. Though. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, it, you would face perhaps a, a good bit of uh, counter verbiage. In the press and in, in other places, but you will not lose your tax exempt stuff. You know, I think the left realizes the fight over taking away the tax exempt status of churches is a losing cause. I think they have moved on, especially like in France, Canada, that if you say from the pulpit, transgenders goes against the very word of God, it goes against the human nature. It could come a time in the States that minister could be thrown in jail for hate speech. So they have substituted this thing about losing a tax exempt status and substituted hate speech. And I think in lots of ways that's really dangerous. <laughs> there are times and they're rare, please please hear that. There are times when a person must choose, shall we please God or shall we please the demands of man? And uh, when those rare times surface, one thinks about the weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? Okay. Um, I'm not gonna spend any time on this, just to refresh your memories. Um, Metax has talked about this, I think it's mythological um, situation where a Gestapo agent is coming up to the front door of a German yeah. home and saying, do you have a Jew in your basement? And well, we, we can't lie, right? God will punish me for lying. No, but if I say, yes, I have a Jew in my basement, I've just condemned somebody I was trying to save to death, right? What do you do? What's the moral thing to do to your um, so would God forgive us our very false witness by saying, no, no Jew here? And, of course, and the answer is, of course, right? And it's what once upon a time was called the little white lie. <laughs> Probably can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you get the idea, right? If, if, if God is that evil master or that harsh master, I shouldn't have said evil, harsh master, um, no, I can't tell a lie. But you know, we, we have to understand the, the greater good happens, and God has put us in place for the greater good, right? And that was Metaxas' point. Mm -hmm. um, but what about when the state itself becomes evil? I, I don't want to get into specifics of, of a government, state, local, or federal at this point, but generically speaking, when when the group of us having consulted together come to a conclusion that um, a governmental entity is evil, what then? What does the church do? Does it worry about tax-exempt status? It shouldn't. Isn't yeah. that basically right. what we should have done with COVID? There were a couple churches that did say this is evil by the state saying that houses of worship are not essential, but the bars and the marijuana houses were. Yeah. Yep. So, in essence, the churches should have fought back against the closing. And as you say, some did, some did not. And it's the same, I think, dynamic that led to the division of pastors and, and uh, Bonhoeffer's time. <laughs> um, there's, yes, please, Russ. So, <clears throat> Back to God, I mean, probably first or second session. All of the different, many of these different statements here are the different examples. Um, we seem to be, to easily say it's evil. Um, I can probably make an argument on every one of these that, that is a Christian argument mm -hmm. that would support that decision that was made. Do I agree necessarily? No. 
But for us to state that the entity had an evil intent, that bar, in my opinion, is extraordinarily high. Mm -hmm. Because I am not that. I do not have all the information. I was not sitting in the seat for the shoes of the person that had to make the decision at the time when they made that decision. Maybe they made the wrong decision, maybe not. But for me to condemn an entity or a person as evil, I struggle with that. And we can do that really easily. And we can fall down the path that you had on the previous slide about I'm God. Well, I know mm -hmm. they're evil. <laughs> How do you know? You've got to be really, really, really sure. And many of these issues are extremely complicated. Extraordinarily yeah. complicated. And, and I can go through many of these, which we have done studies in my previous job, that you can argue maybe is wrong decision, but it supports what happened in COVID in this state. See, it's the right answer. But for us to say that that's evil and that they were targeting, I struggle with it. Especially if we're going to define evil as of Satan. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know. You have to hear that. You have to hear that. One of the things I'm very extremely grateful for, I know I'm not the judge. I don't have to judge anybody. God will do that in due time. However, I do believe as a Christian, and looking at the world, there are definitely things that are evil. I mean, a lot of these young girls coming across the border, you know, like they're sold into prostitution rings. You look at the transgender movement, which is being forced down our throats and into our kids' grade schools. I think that's, I think that's, and there are, of course, other examples, <laughs> but I think trying to be loving is great, but I don't think we should sweep under the rug things that are clearly evil and go against God's will. That's what I would think. I think we can define evil. So... Is my opinion. Let me just very briefly. How do you know a prophet is a prophet? When when what the prophet says becomes fact. Yep. Right? And that can be hundred in Isaiah's case, it was six hundred years later before we knew Isaiah was a prophet. How do you know evil is truly evil? It's got to play out, unfortunately, right? It's the the parable of the weeds and the wheat, right? They grow up together and don't separate them. God's angels will come and do that later. <laughs> How did Bonhoeffer, uh, almost alone, but was certainly a, a tiny minority among pastors, let alone Germans, see Hitler's rise and the Nazi rise as evil? I think that that's pretty rare to be prophetic like that. So how do we know? How do we know? Extreme care has to be taken, as, as was pointed out to us. But we don't need to bury it. We need to oh, talk no. about it. Oh. And that's what, what oh, I'm, right. I'm hearing a lot of people are doing. Let's not talk about it. We, we're not going to step on anyone's toes. Right. And then that's what the next point in the next chapter in part was. Uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be just here for the motions on Sunday, right? That's religiosity. And, and, and it, it serves no earthly purpose other than to make us feel like we did our duty or some such thing, right? Um, we should be working to, to do Christ's will with every breath we take. Does that mean we're going to get everything right? No. Does that mean we're going to identify every situation perfectly? No. And we better recognize that, that we're not going to do that perfectly. Therefore, we, we do it carefully, and we do it with 
God's guidance and let God be the leader instead of us taking the lead and uh, making of ourselves a God. Right? Again. And to, to the comment you made earlier about we talking amongst ourselves, I made the spot up. But in addition, we need to talk to those who we don't agree with. Oh, sure. And that conversation that we talked about earlier in love, in understanding, to truly learn to understand a different point of view. You we may not agree with it and we may have some changes, or we may say, you know, I didn't understand. I, I see your point. I, I may still not agree, but now we have a more common understanding and you have the opportunity to change minds as opposed to those who are all in the same mind. So not only us talking to ourselves, important to learn amongst ourselves, but to go out and have the conversations with those you probably wouldn't be comfortable talking to. Yeah. Well, that's essential. I used to teach critical thinking at the college. And by golly, it's just like two people getting divorced. <laughs> if you just listen to one side, you only got half the story. Exactly. But again, I maintain there is instances of healing. I'm a father of two daughters. I can't be. Having my daughters so into the next legs. Mr. Carroll. It, it, to me, clearly, that is the, the trouble we get into is when we try to then project that right to a whole train of thought. I think, you know, is there an immigration crisis? Yes. Does that make it all evil? No. Are there cartel members exploiting young girls? Yes, that's evil, and they should be dealt with in a very harsh manner. But it's the old, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's make sure we understand where everyone is coming from with this larger issue. Pastor Jerry and I were talking about this at lunch, right? Um, somebody comes across the modern border, and what's Jesus' command to us, his followers, it is to take in and, and, and provide for the sojourner, right? At the same time, you have people who are acting in such ways that you could label as evil in the exploitation and the harmful behavior they inflict upon that very sojourner. So because migration is, is causing great pressure, it doesn't mean the migrant becomes the uh, object of our, our anger or ire or whatever you want to call it. We, we've got to separate that. We've got to love that person and we've got to deal with practices that are unloving and untruthful and quite frankly, unchristian. Somehow, but as Russ says, how do you do that if you haven't gone out and, and discovered what's really going on? And the other thing that has happened in our society is there are generational differences in that when I was going to Michigan State, uh, we would have speakers, but we would have speakers from both sides. Now there's only one viewpoint. Right. And if you have an opposing viewpoint, the activist level of, I meant, I heard a college professor here, uh, maybe can actually fill us in of our generation. Most of us look like we're um, not um, millennials. <laughs> but again, just by labeling them, there is some kind of judgment there. But in general, we had an ability to be tolerant and listen to someone else. Now there is no tolerance, and sometimes families are broken apart because they can't even discuss who's running for a president. You know, they children are canceling parents because of who they vote for. Well, 
I'm really blessed because I'll just say, well, it's a it's a secret ballot. I don't have to discuss it. <laughs> right? Or another man on our street said, la 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 this against this person, this against, and I said, Did you vote? And he said, No, I never vote. I says, Well then you don't have a right to discuss politics with me if you refuse to vote. <laughs> But again, we could do that and still get along. We have people canceling people. Uh, what's it called on your phone? You block people, and they might even be family members. Well, let's, so why have we gotten to that point? That to me. Well, we can argue about the why forever. But let me let me just throw something out. Okay. Right? We have division among us. We have R's and D's, and I've talked about maybe we need Christians in the mix too. And R's and D's don't talk to each other. They sit on different ends of the table at Thanksgiving and all that kind of stuff in our families. <laughs> so maybe maybe churches could be countercultural to that existing cultural trend, right? Maybe churches could host good old-fashioned civil political debate so that people of both opinions can come and be heard respectfully. Just a thought that I got as you were talking. Maybe we can be different and, and be as your neighbor has just suggested. I'm, I'm avoiding names because it's recorded, right? <laughs> um, maybe we can show civility and use my mother's favorite way of going about things. God gave you two ears and one mouth, use them proportionately and listen to both sides if they're given voice. Maybe yeah, that's something we can contribute to our community. More than one, two sides. There well, that's okay. Six sides. That's okay. We have chairs. <laughs> Seriously. But maybe that's something we could contribute to our local uh, environment of you know, just having civil discussions, debates, if necessary, uh, about these things without throwing rocks, tomatoes, or anything else. Many here are the age that they remember to be at Don Air. No, and I would tell you that many of the feelings that we feel today were felt then. <laughs> yeah, and we still suffer from the feelings we felt then, right? We never resolve them, we never talk them out. We still have arguments in congregations as to whether or not we can put the flag up, up, up in the front of the sanctuary. And that came about in Vietnam, largely. So part of the challenge is, <clears throat> I've heard stated a number of times already how bad things are going to get, and it's getting worse. How do you know? What do you think it was like back in the 60s? What do you think it was like back in the 50s? What do you think it was like back in the 30s? What do you think it was like back in the 20s? What do you go back in time? And as I read history, I, I ask myself, you know, Things were pretty bad back then, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so um, I would just encourage us to not over analyze today because we're living in today. We're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's the worst it's ever been. <laughs> the reality is, if we were living back 80 years from uh, ago, we would probably have the same feeling. Things are really bad today, right? So step back a bit, ask yourself about the blessings we do have. This country has got the ability, and you have the ability, to have this conversation. You have the ability for somebody who does not think like you can make a statement the way they can make that statement. That is not true in most any other country in the world. Right. You have the ability, and that's why this argument, this issue about 501c3, I think is a good thing, because otherwise, we would be, in, in my opinion, people being people, we'd politicize the churches, all right? And you'd start having, I'm going to that church because they say vote for so-and-so. I'm going to that church because they say vote for that. And suddenly we're going, wait, wait a minute, we just lost the Bible here. Okay, So that's my own view on that. Yep. The point is, is the separation of church and state, your ability to have an unalienable right to speak, mm -hmm. even if I don't agree with you, is a wonderful thing. So let's use it right. And let's protect it. And protect it and use it right. Because I think we've abused it and I think we've gotten lazy. Well, I think I think your your ability to point out the way things have been at other points in history is tremendously valid. And, and what I hold up right next to that is 
God put you here now. He didn't put you here during the Depression or during Hitler's rise or during the Civil War or any of those things that were horrible. He put you here now. Yeah. So we must deal with the situations we have now as Christians in truth and in love. <clears throat> that's it. And has it been getting worse? No, that's subjective. That's not an issue of the church. God put you here now. I went through all those errors you just made. Just talk about that. <laughs> um, and remember, you're Christians. I'll just answer my own question. You are Christians wherever you are, whether you're dealing with politics of the world or you invite the politics of the world in, as, as I was just sort of uh, inspired to suggest maybe we do, not, not throw it out, but bring it in for discussion. Um, we're Christians through it all. And that this truth, capital T, is a person, capital P, means we take Christ with us into every environment in which we enter. And pardon me as I'm going faster because I see that clock. And so we have to ask ourselves, if, if we weren't afraid of being pointed at or disparaged or being in the minority, uh, when opinions are shared, what would our faith look like? How would we begin to live? And that was pointed out a good bit by our brother. A good bit. How would that look? Again, two ears, one mouth, right? It's a good place to start. It'd be very freeing because we'd have no fear. We wouldn't worry about things. We, we'd just live abundantly. What do you have to fear? Jesus died on a cross for you, for a reason, so that you wouldn't have to fear. You don't even have to fear death. Now that's, yeah, I get it. I get it. That's pie in the sky. That's stuff right out of seminary. But that is the truth. It is the truth. But our emotions override the truth all too often, right? And so we're afraid to speak. We're afraid to listen to a counter viewpoint. We're afraid to deal with our world. We're coming at your our biggest problem. It's our own emotion. Well, our world is different now because we have such mass communication. And all the time we're on our phone, we're on our tablet, we're on TV, watching, watching, watching. How did we get this mass communication in the 60s? when all of this was going on. So we are overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed. But it's our choice to listen to it or do our own research. And we choose just to listen to it and go along with it. A lot of us do. And a lot of us don't. So it's our choice. We It comes down to we have a choice to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And and the word of God tells us the right thing. So we need to go there first and then we from there. We have to be careful. You're, I don't disagree with what you say, but we have to be careful in the modern world because of the mass of information that's available to us. None of us can take it all in. So what most of us do is we apply our own personal filter, right? We listen to these sources, but not those. And so the truth that we come to is, is generally not all the information, but some subset of it, the ones that are initially pleasing to us. And that can become a problem because yeah. we don't we aren't hearing the countervailing voices. <laughs> and if you go to a news channel, you're going to hear one voice or another in the modern world. You're not going to hear countervailing voices to any appreciable degree. You know, as much as as much as they can give you, they don't give it to you, give it all to you, or certainly not in a balanced fashion. None of them do. That makes that makes discerning tough unless you listen to a wider audience or a wider group of speakers. <clears throat> um, again, I'm trying to be sensitive to your time here, but in Texas, uh, use Reagan's speech at the Brandenburg Gate. Mr. Gorbachev chaired on this wall back in 87, and he drew comparisons to Bonhoeffer, Wilberforce, and David in that 
these were courageous people that did things that were beyond the majority. You know, just take that part of the example. Um, what of us? How much like Bonhoeffer, I, I'll use that example a little more. How much like Bonhoeffer can we be when and if this situation arises? Do we have that fortitude? To, to be a small voice in a larger wilderness. It's a tough call. It sort of depends on what you're talking about as, as it has been pointed out. Um, but if we shrink from that, when, when the Spirit puts it upon you, as it did with Bonhoeffer and the rise of Nazism, when the Spirit puts it upon you and, and you choose not to go the Spirit's way, what then? Okay, admittedly, that's relatively rare. But we have to be wise as servants. And when that, that situation arises, we have to be aware of it. I think we can add Ronald Reagan's name to that. That was the bomb talker. Boy, David and others, because I was teaching in California when Reagan turned the Soviet Union. An uh, evil empire. I think it was something like that. Yep. Now, boy, did my colleagues go crazy. <laughs> they went off the rocks. So that's why, I, I mean, I really admire Reagan coming out and speaking the truth, even perhaps it was popular in all sections of the country. So the Soviet Union has fallen. It's not the boogeyman that it was perceived to be in, in my youth. Um, what is our boogeyman? Do we need a boogeyman? Do we have to build one if there isn't one? That's that's another that's a question for another day. That's the human way of behaving, isn't it? Yeah. But what is our Goliath? Now, is there one? TikTok. <laughs> TikTok. Yeah. Um. What things in our time must the church get its back stiff about? And how do we go about defining those things? It's a grand challenge that require care and time invested in, in something like this and, and what might follow it. And, and that's why I put this up. <laughs> I naively thought, because I made many less, fewer slides than I've made in the other classes, but I thought we'd have a little time to talk about this. And it didn't happen on Sunday either. So now, now I have a clipboard up here, right? If you have some topics that you think are worthy of a pointed discussion, potential boogeymen, if you want to think of it that way, um, come and put, put it on here or send me an email if you'd rather do it in that fashion. And uh, I'll work with Pastor Jerry and we'll pick some topics and then have some future forums to talk about specific social issues of our time and hear each other's voices in that and hear a good number of perspectives. So if you're bold, put it here. If you want to think about it for a while or if you want, uh, you want to just have private communication, you're welcome to do that as well. And again, my email address is on those cards in the back. Just fire it in. And it'll be a few weeks because I'm going to be out of commission right after Easter for a while. But uh, we'll, we'll get to them and uh, try to figure out which ones first, second, and third. It's going to be the hardest part about that. But we'll try to be faithful to that as well. Let, let me close with some scripture. Scripture you have heard, actually one person in here has quoted at one point, um, a mini parable that comes out of Matthew's gospel where Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? Now, the chemists among us will tell you that salt is salt and it doesn't lose its saltiness. <laughs> Jesus is making another point here, not the chemical point. If something loses what it was intended by God in its creation to be, that's what he's talking about here. It's no longer, if that's the case, then that which God created is no longer good for anything in God's eyes, but is thrown away. And we, so if you are salt, what did God create you to be? And if you're not being that, what then? That's where Jesus is going. Loving and truthful, I think, is top-notch and what God created you to be. 
And then immediately following that is another small parable. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Anybody heard verse 16 before? Yeah. Yeah? Anybody want to say where they heard it? When the uh, person being baptized is handed the candle? That's, that is where it comes from, Matthew um, 5.16. Mm -hmm. You know, these are the things we're admonished at the time we become a child of God. Are we light to the world? Not hammers, light. Are we bringing God's perspective in a loving and truthful manner? into the, the public discourse. That's light. But it's fun to be a hammer. So <laughs> just my, father, my father used to say that. He said everything can be fixed with a bigger hammer. <laughs> <laughs> my mother had to take his hammers. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, but I leave you with those thoughts. As, uh, as was said, these are the things we have we have to consider. And um, these were scriptures that uh, Mr. Metaxas actually closed his uh, discussion notes with. And I think we should, we should hear that and we, and we should live that as best we can. All right. Mm -hmm. The Lord be with you. Lord, 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 Lord. Let us pray. <laughs> Lord God, you know what you made us to be. Servants of Jesus Christ who go out into the world taking his truth and love to every situation we find in our families, in our neighborhoods, our church, and yes, in the world, the greater world around us. But Lord God, fear is why we don't do that as well as you have made us to do. We struggle. We, we worry about some, what somebody's going to say about us or what they're going to think about us or how they're going to treat us. Lord God, help us not to worry about these things as much as we do, but instead to worry about the well-being of our neighbors. And when we worry about that, we will offer that love that you put within us and share it with others so that Jesus Christ may be more widely known and more deeply loved. Lord God, send us now out into this world to do just these things. As you admonish us on Sunday, you admonish us now. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, 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 thanks be to God. And good night to you all.